Hello, everybody. I'm so glad that you came. And um, like I say, my, my purpose here is to help with very practical veterinary medicine. Um, you can go to the university and learn a lot of very deep uh, skills and things like this. But what I'm looking for is something that you can immediately go into the examination room and use uh, very practically. And so what I wanted to do um, today is going over a few things, just the common avian diseases. Now there's bacterial and viral diseases uh, out there in birds, but there's, there's a few big ones that you just need to be aware of. And we're not going to be, uh, very, I'm not gonna go very deeply into them, but at least to the point where you will know that these uh, diseases are out there. And then you can read up more about them because there's a lot of information on the internet. And then also feather picking behavior, which is probably the number one thing that I, I deal with. And that's more of a psychological problem with the birds. And then also anesthesia. And I'll be talking about injectable anesthesia and uh, gas or inhalation anesthesia. Um, and I use primarily inhalation anesthesia nowadays, but we used to do the uh, injectable and sometimes that's all people have available. So We'll talk about that. But um, as far as the common diseases, these are some big ones that are, people need to know about. Uh, chlamydia um, and then beak and feather disease is what they call it, polyoma disease, Pacheco's disease, and proventricular dilatation disease. And as we go into that, um, and like I said, my purpose here is to give you, make you aware of the diseases and some little tips on how you can maybe tell what they are without having to do pathology and send in samples to a laboratory to have them uh, uh, tell you on histopathology. But avian chlamydiosis is called parrot fever quite often or psittacosis. And it is a gram negative um, intracellular parasite actually. Um, it is one of these things that um, we used to get in with uh, a lot of the birds that were uh, sent into the United States. And it is a disease where you get a lot of uh, respiratory signs, um, a real lethargic bird. This is kind of, you know, birds come in like this and, and you know that they're sick, but you're not quite sure exactly what's going on with them, but they're very lethargic and that the uh, one of the things that you'll run into is they are having problems with their liver and problems breathing. They're, so uh, what they'll be very, they'll be very tired. They'll have breathing problems. The reason you'll know that there's a liver problem is the urine portion. And I'll show a picture of this in a little bit. The urine portion that um, comes out of them will be yellow instead of white because the urine should always be white. And uh, I'm going to show a little bit about the disease. You'll notice here I have the treatments that we use. We use doxycycline for this. It is, uh, uh, the doses are here. This is something I wanted to make sure you'd have access on YouTube or on the VetNet Foundation India website. So you could go back to this if you need to. But a lot of the psittacosis are in Amazon parrots, the cockatiels, and the budgerigars. And there is a test for it, a PCR test. However, you need access to a laboratory. Uh, the other thing is the owners can get this disease. And if, if people get this disease, um, they also need to go on doxycycline antibiotic. And I've had several cases where the owners caught the disease from the bird. And luckily I was able to talk to the I told the owner, I said, your bird, your bird has this disease. They were sick at the time. And I said, you need to tell your, your doctor, your physician about this. And we got them on the right medication. But it is called parrot fever. They're very lethargic like this. If you have a dead bird and uh, you open it up, one of the big things you'll see is usually a yellowish swollen liver. And then if I take and turn this liver over right here, 
the spleen is enlarged. And that is a very big thing. If you see a large spleen and an enlarged spleen in a bird um, will be about, oh, probably one centimeter in diameter, but it'll, it'll be very obvious. But if I see liver problems and a large spleen, I'm going to think about psittacosis. It's very contagious to the birds. So if I get a sick bird with uh, chlamydia or any of these diseases, we want to get it away from the other birds. Here I said, remember, this is the stool of the bird. And then these are the urates. And the urates is the portion that should be white that comes out of them. And I've talked about that previously. And it's the part of the urine that is uh, concentrate, urates that are concentrated by the kidney. And then a lot of times you'll have a watery portion. But when I see this yellow part, I'm worried about liver problems. And so there's a few diseases I think about and chlamydia is one of them. Uh, so like I said, the treatment for this is doxycycline and uh, it can be given orally uh, to the bird uh, on some of the uh, cockatiels and the smaller birds will actually put it in the drinking water for them to drink. Uh, there's also a, a vibrovenous injection that you can give once a week, but it has to be the vibrovenous doxycycline made in Europe. The American vibrovenous or doxycycline uh, is very uh, toxic to the uh, muscle, so you can't use that one. So Again, that one is one you have to be a little careful with, but the oral medication works very, very well. And we have to treat them for about 30 to 45 days. So it's a long treatment. When we get into beak and feather disease, we now know that this is called by circovirus. And it is where we have abnormal feathers and they're pinched off and everything. We see a bird that kind of looks like this, you know, that's all picked. And uh, I'll come back to that slide in a second. But they're abnormal feathers. So uh, it's not just that the feathers are gone. It's that they look like they're pinched off and they're twisting. And they just look very, very odd. Later in the disease, quite often the beak will become necrotic. And you've got the outer part of the beak here. But if you look on the inner side of the beak, a lot of times it will look like it's almost rotting in there. And, um, and that is something that you need to be aware of. And they can also get neurological signs. So we can get birds that are just not mentally acting right. There is no treatment. There is a test, a PCR test that you can take for the blood or uh, swab the feathers. However, if we have a positive bird, this is a bird that is never going to get well. Uh, there's no treatment for it. So it just, but it definitely needs to be separated off um, because it will pass it to other birds. And usually they pass it, our thought is they pass it to young birds uh, rather than older birds. So it's the young birds that are in danger of catching this disease. Um, the big thing you have to watch is that it looks like just a feather picking bird. And we'll talk about this in a second, but the difference is if I have a bird that looks totally healthy on its head, but it's feather picked or there's feathers missing from the neck down, then I have to start thinking if this is a virus like beak and feather disease or circovirus, the feathers on the head should be affected as much as the feathers on the body. But if the feathers on the head are totally normal, then that's an area that the bird cannot pick. They can't sit there and, and bother those feathers. So on a feather picking bird, the head will be perfectly normal. The body will be bad. Quite often on a beak and feather or a circovirus bird, the whole bird will have abnormal feathers. Again, it takes testing to know for sure, but that's something that you can think about in the exam room. And like I say, when I see this bird, the two things I think about are, is this a bird that is picking its own feathers? Or is it a bird that has beak and feather disease, um, which is, like I say, a circovirus and something we need to worry about? Here you get a feather loss bird. And 
the things I think about on this one, on a cockatiel is, again, it's missing feathers on the head. So it could, be, it could be a circovirus. It could also be the question I have on this bird is, is there another one or two birds in the cage that could be picking this bird's feathers? Because quite often when they're aggressive, they'll pick at the back of the head like this. So this can be either a feather picking uh, by a different bird. It won't be this bird because he can't reach his head feathers. So I know that this bird's not picking himself. But so it's either a disease or it is uh, being picked by another bird. Um, but again, if in doubt, separate the birds away from the other birds. Another disease is polyomavirus. We don't see this as much now as we used to, uh, probably because we understand it. But um, polyomavirus is primarily a disease in young birds. So it's a very... Uh, it's, it's a disease in uh, birds usually under about, oh, eight to 12 weeks old. Um, it does cause um, usually sudden death quite often in the younger ones, and it'll, you'll, you'll lose usually the whole nest grouping uh, of birds does have liver abnormalities, uh, quite often gets ascites or fluid in the abdomen. Uh, one of the uh, big things that you will see on these guys will be, and I'll come back, is you'll see the heart here and you'll see hemorrhage on the heart. So you'll see bleeding on the heart. And this is one of the uh, diseases that this is about the only disease that I no usually notice that. But if you see that and you have younger birds dying, that's a big uh, thought for you is that it could be uh, polyomavirus. Um, in parakeets or budger agars, uh, they used to call this budgie fledgling disease. And these are birds that get uh, quite often very abnormal feathers growing out and they will have these abnormal feathers for life. Um, but anyway, that's, again, you can run, you, could, you can uh, look up more on this disease. The main thing, I want to do is make you aware of it. The treatment for this, there is a vaccine for it, but what we found is if I have an older bird, usually what will happen is the older bird will catch the virus. They do not get the disease, but they are carrying the disease and they bring it back to the young birds who are in the nest box and the breeders. And then all the babies die and the adults are only the one bringing the disease in. So uh, they will be asymptomatic. The main thing we found to stop this disease is you stop breeding. You pull all the nest boxes so that nobody's breeding for about six months. And usually what will happen is the disease in a few months will go in and out of the adults and then they'll be back to normal you don't bring any new birds in or anything. And then after about six months, you can start breeding again and the disease will be gone. Um, so like I say, the, the danger is the adult birds are what brings it into the babies. So you don't want um, to have people around other people's birds. The uh, big danger here was people would have bird clubs and they would come talk about their birds and they would bring their birds all to these rooms and they would be visiting and showing off their birds. Well, one bird would give this to another bird. You know, they didn't know their bird had polyomavirus, but it gave it to another bird. Then they went home where they had baby birds. This bird gave it to the baby birds and all the baby birds died. And quite often about 80 to 100% of the babies will die. And uh, so you have to be very careful about, you know, people mixing birds from different places. The uh, cockatoos, African greys, and Amazon seem to be very resistant to this disease. However, uh, eclectus parrots uh, are very, very sensitive. And that's probably the number one uh, that we got right here. And this is a male eclectus. We know the, the boys are green. 
the girls are red. It's the only bird that's very easy to tell which ones are boys and girls. But uh, again, eclectus are very sensitive. Uh, cockatoos and African grays seem to be less sensitive uh, to the point where I, I usually don't see it in those birds. Again, hemorrhage in the heart is something I'm very, very much looking for. And a situation where the babies are dying, but not the adults. The adults seem to be fine. They don't show any symptoms at all. Another bird uh, disease is Pacheco's disease, and this is a herpes virus. Um, I don't see this as much nowadays because people are not, you know, bringing in quarantine birds and birds from out of the country. But this was uh, a disease quite often carried by Nanday Conyers, uh, were the most well-known and Patagonian Conyers, and what they would do is they would be quite often look healthy, but they would pass it again to other birds. And the number one thing I would notice is this, these were birds where the people would come in and say, my bird just died. It was on the perch. It looked okay. And it dropped and it was dead when it hit the ground. It's very, very acute death um, on this disease. And again, the number one sign is uh, a swollen or yellowish mottled liver. Um, this is one of these where, again, if you get any of the birds showing any of these signs, you get them, first thing you do is get them away from all the other birds. You need to try to quarantine them so that we don't pass the disease. There is a treatment we know called acyclovir. It's a uh, antiviral disease or a medication. What we're not sure of is we think as carriers. So the question is, do you use it or do you not use it? But the main thing I have to do with uh, Pacheco's disease is if we have birds that are dying and getting sick, I'm gonna separate those birds away from all the healthy birds. And then the birds, those birds were near to, I'm going to try to separate them too. So I need to get these birds spread far enough apart that they're not going to be either um, sneezing on each other or a lot of these are passed by uh, uh, dust from stools. So they, they go to the bathroom on the bottom of the cage, it dries out, they flap their wings and the, and the uh, particles from the stool will go from cage to cage. So it can happen that way or it can happen directly from bird to bird if it has another bird in the cage with it. Um, so, like I said, it's herpes virus for Pacheco's disease has also been shown to cause um, a couple other diseases, such as uh, papilloma virus, which is a uh, uh, kind of little virus on the uh, vents or where the birds go to the bathroom and sometimes up in the roof of the mouth. It's called uh, papilloma virus or papillomatosis. It's not a papilloma virus, it's papillomatosis. And then also uh, it can cause cancers called bile duct carcinomas. So um, like I say, Pacheco's disease, the main thing on this one is it kills very, very fast and you need to get the birds separated apart so that the sick birds very likely may die. The, the birds that are not sick, hopefully will not come in contact with the disease. Pretty similar to COVID here. So again, we have our swollen livers. Things I think about are bacterial hepatitis, Chlamydia, like I just talked about, uh, Pacheco's disease, and then fatty liver. You know, if these birds are just eating nothing but sunflower seeds or high fat foods, the same thing happens to them as to people that are fat and get high fat foods, and you can get abnormal fat in the body. But um, another one is called proventricular dilatation disease or PDD. And this is currently being associated with Bornavirus. Um, so they're testing for Bornavirus. Uh, it may have some other cause along with the Bornavirus. That's what we don't know. But proventricular dilatation disease, again, is a disease with no treatment or no cure. Um, but the big thing you see is the birds are losing weight. Quite often they're throwing up their food and they're passing seed in the stool. So although they're eating the food, it is not digesting. So they don't 
um, so they're losing weight and um, getting very, very thin. The big thing that you will uh, notice on this disease is here's the proventriculus or the stomach of the bird. Remember on the, the bird, we have the esophagus of the throat. It goes into the stomach or the proventriculus, then into the gizzard, which is the ventriculus, and then into the intestinal tract and out. So the big thing is if I'm doing a necropsy or an autopsy on a bird, and I see uh, a very large, very thin-walled uh, stomach or proventriculus, I have to think about this. And then the other thing I'm looking for is now I've got stool and you'll notice there's seed in this stool. There shouldn't be any seed passing through. And occasionally this can be a bacterial infection. So sometimes if you aren't sure what's going on, you can treat this bird with antibiotics. However, if it's big thin, it's passing seed in the stool, quite often uh, throwing up food, then I worry about um, the proventricular dilatation disease. So, like I said, this is uh, one of those where there is a test for it. We're not sure whether to really put 100% trust in the test, but uh, there's, this is one of the diseases. There's, there's a lot of research going on right now. There is the only treatment are some anti-inflammatories. Uh, uh, the celecoxib here is a human medication. Meloxicam is a veterinary and human medication. Sometimes it makes them feel better um, and prolongs their life, but this is not one that you're gonna cure. So like I said, I wanted to go through these diseases only to make you aware that they're out there so that if you, uh, if you start seeing a bird that dies or you uh, have an aviary with a lot of birds and you get, you know, one bird dies, when you get that second bird or that third bird dies, you need to start separating birds immediately because something's going on very contagious. And the worst thing to do is to lose the whole group of birds. So we run into that. And again, you can go back and look at some of the specifics on this. The other thing I wanted to talk about here is avian anesthesia. Now, we use here in the United States, a lot of uh, inhalation anesthesia. So isoforin gas anesthesia with oxygen. A lot of people don't have access to that. So first of all, I'm gonna go over the injectable anesthesia and we'll use ketamine. Um, this is uh, information that I used to, I used to use ketamine all the time before we had gas anesthesia. Uh, the doses I have down here are from Dr. Uh, Walt Roscoff and uh, uh, Richard Warple. Uh, and this is back in the 80s. However, these doses work as well now as they did then. Um, and you'll notice on it, it's based on the, on the body weight of the bird. The smaller birds take a larger amount than, or the smaller birds take a larger uh, amount per size than the larger birds do. And so if I have a, uh, this smaller, the smaller group up here are going to be birds like maybe uh, uh, parakeets or cockatiels, some of the smaller birds, uh, parrotlets. Uh, the middle group is gonna be your parrots and your African grays and some of those. Uh, your larger group are going to be cockatoos and macaws. But again, you can weigh your birds. And uh, as I had in the first uh, talk that I did, you can just get a little uh, scale like you would use in a kitchen and you can weigh these birds. Uh, but the way you do this is you can use either ketamine or what I used to do is I would add a half a milliliter of ace promazine to one bottle of ketamine. And then I would use that because it seemed ketamine quite often, the birds are very jerky um, quite often when they're waking up and the ace promazine seems to make that smoother. So they're not quite as jerky. Um, again, I like gas anesthesia much better, but if 
you have to do something with an anesthetized bird, ketamine does work. And what we do is I have an example here in the very center. If I have a 350 gram Amazon parrot, and I used to use this all the time when we were doing what they call surgical sexing in birds, where we'd have to do a uh, take an endoscope and, and go in and look at their testicles or ovaries to tell if they're male and female when we were trying to pair birds up for breeding. But what we would do is for a 350 gram bird, uh, and if I want to use the lower dose right up here in the center, again, 0.05 to 0.1 milligram per gram times 350 grams is 17.5 milligrams. And since the bottle is 100 milligrams per milliliter, I would pull up 0.17 milliliters and I could give that as the injection, as the dose. Again, if I had added my acepromazine, again, it would be 0.17 milliliters. That's the low dose. The higher dose is 0.34. And one of the problems with injectable anesthesia is you just have to get used to it. You have to do this to enough birds that you kind of get a feel for how it works. Um, this will usually keep birds down for a period of time. If you have to re-inject them, sometimes you can re-inject them with half the dose later. This is given IM. We'll usually inject it just into the chest uh, on the birds like this. When they're waking up, I will usually put them in what I call a birdie burrito, or we will just kind of lightly wrap them in a towel because they will slowly wake up that way. Or sometimes we'll put them in a grocery sack. Uh, this is a paper sack from in the United States. And that way they will stay usually uh, very quiet and asleep. But then when they start waking up, you want them to be in a quiet area because quite often if they get excited, they'll start flapping. If you can keep them quiet and dark, they'll wake up very gently and just stand up. Um, so like I say, that's, that's our injectable anesthesia that way. And again, I have this here so that you'll have the doses. Um, and this is what I used for years and years and years uh, before we use the gas anesthesia. And I'm gonna go over gas anesthesia because it is the thing that, um, people use now uh, and there's some pot good points and some bad points to gas anesthesia. Um, we use isoforane now and oxygen and uh, there's also what they call sevoflurane. I don't like that as well because it's almost too good. They go down too quickly, they come up too quickly and I need a little bit of time to, to see if they're getting light if I'm doing a surgery. But um, what we will do is quite often just mask them down and they'll just fall asleep right there with the mask. Um, again, sometimes I will use a tracheal tube and put it in. Birds, their windpipe is right on top of their tongue. So when you open their mouth, it is very easy to see their trachea. Their windpipe or larynx is right on top of the tongue and it's very easy to put a tracheal tube in there if you need to. Uh, I always do this in my eagles and the, and the larger birds that I treat. Sometimes I don't do this on Amazons if I'm doing a quick procedure. But um, like I said, you want to watch these birds very carefully um, when they're under gas anesthesia. And the number one thing you want to have is a, a technician or an assistant watching that bird breathing while you're doing what you're doing, because it's hard to monitor a bird and do your surgery at the same time. But like I said, quite often, I will just mask the birds down. We will hold them in a towel um, gently, put the mask on, they will fall asleep. And at this point, we can uh, keep them under anesthesia. I want you to remember that birds breathe with air sacs. They have nine air sacs. So their air sacs, um, are under the chest and their chest goes up and down. You cannot hold that chest down or you will suffocate a bird. They have to make sure that it's going up and down. So if you're holding them uh, down here, again, you cannot squeeze them. I need to make sure that that chest goes up and down. 
I can also put a tracheal tube in. The good news on a tracheal tube, it keep, keeps an open airway. Um, the bad news on tracheal tubes is for small birds, and especially pigeons, doves, and some of the birds, if they have a very small tube like these upper ones, sometimes they'll produce a little bit of a mucus in their windpipe and these tubes will block. And then you have a bird that can't breathe at all um, through the tube. So if you have a small bird, you have to be very sure that that bird is breathing well. Otherwise you have to pull that tracheal tube, clean it out, put it back in. That's not a problem I see with the bigger birds, but it is something you need to pay attention to. So this is where I'm doing surgery on a bird. And uh, you'll notice I have the head, I have the bird at a little bit of an angle like this. So the head is up here, body's down there. I don't want any food from the crop to come down into the mouth. So I will have the head a little bit elevated. I have my assistant watching the breathing on the bird. In fact, you'll see her, her finger right here. She's lightly feeling the chest go up and down. And that's because I'm wiggling the bird and she doesn't trust that she can see it as well. So she's doing that. I'm doing the operation here. The bird came in yesterday, as a matter of fact. Everything was healed. It looked great. And, uh, and it was a successful surgery. But this is one where somebody had trimmed the wings wrong. And when it tried to fly, it just went straight down to the ground and cut the, uh, the skin over the keel bone. And I had to repair the injury. So we're doing that, stitching it up. What you do with gas anesthesia is instead of turning the machine up and down on concentration of the gas, you just move the gas away from the bird. The easiest way to monitor this bird is for this gas to be on or off or on or off, and then you can keep it right where you want it. So I will usually have the gas on, on fairly high, and I'm finishing up the procedure here. And birds, if there's a danger on their gas anesthesia, quite often it's right as you finish a procedure and they will quit breathing. And so what my technician knows is as I start getting close to the end, she starts letting the bird get lighter and lighter and lighter. So it is hopefully not wiggling, but almost ready to wake up by the time that I finish doing my procedure. Um, if I get a bird that stops breathing, I will actually get a tracheal tube in the bird and I will, I will blow carbon dioxide in to stimulate the bird to breathe. Now don't breathe back because you don't want to catch any diseases, but I'll breathe and try to breathe. And I found that that has rescued a few birds uh, in my life. So that, that worked. This bird got an Elizabethan collar around his neck because I didn't want him to pick the stitches out. So um, that's what's going on there. Uh, again, gas anesthesia is what I think everybody will eventually be doing. But the ketamine, if you need to anesthetize a bird, the ketamine will give you the ability to do you know, procedures that way. The, the last thing I wanted to talk about today is feather picking, or they'll call it feather destructive behavior. And these are birds um, that, that look very ratty. They've, their feathers are all picked. And this can be a medical problem or a behavioral problem. And although it can be a medical problem, in most cases, it ends up being behavioral. And Normally, a bird out in the wild spends about a third of its time looking for food, about a third of its time grooming, and about a third of time socializing with other birds. The problem that we have is we put a bird in a cage all by itself with no attention, and we give it a bowl of food, and it eats in about five minutes and it doesn't have anything to do for the rest of the day. So these birds quite often will either um, 
over socialize by screaming and try to get attention and doing things that way or over grooming. And quite often, this is like a person that just doesn't have anything to do. So they sit there and chew on their fingernails all day long. So it is a, a problem we run into. Um, and if I see a feather picking bird, I will think about, I will ask the owner, I said, could it be bored? Nothing to do all day long. So it just sits there and picks its feathers. The other thing that is very, very common is the birds are sexually frustrated. And what will happen here is generally birds only touch when they're either fighting or they're breeding. If you'll notice birds in a tree, they're all spread out. They like their own space. They don't like to be real close. And, but what do we do? We have different people that will get a young bird and they will want to love the bird and they will sit there and stroke the bird and hug the bird and, and, and do that sort of thing. And they end up with a sexual response instead of a healthy owner bird response. And when, with all that stroking and rubbing and everything like this, the birds often want to become, uh, they, they want you to be their mate and they can get very frustrated that way. And I will see picking, uh, feather picking that way. So like I said, we need to be very careful with that. And the owners need to know that is not healthy to be stroking your bird all the time. An example I will use here in the United States is quite often people, when they meet, they will give people a quick hug. And if I would see a friend of mine that I haven't seen for a long time, and I would go give him a quick hug and say, tell me what's been going on. How's your family? What have you been doing at work? That's one thing. If I give them a hug and I don't let go for 30 seconds or a minute and I'm rubbing their back, that's a different thing that they're picking up. That's a, that's a different thing. So that's what we're doing with the birds. If I see my bird and I'll sit there and say, you're a good bird, and I'm done. Or I love you, I'm finished. I don't do that for 30 minutes. So be very careful. And your owners will be very heartbroken and say, but I love my bird and I want my bird to love me. And said, but you're causing problems. You're causing problems that way. So here's your feather picking bird. Again, quite often the head will be perfect. The, the problem will be from here down. And I will see three types of what I call picking. I will see the birds that pull their feathers out. I will see the birds that cut their feathers off and it looks like scissors there. And then I'll see the birds that are what I call twizzlers and they take the the feathers and kind of twist them that way. Um, so those are your feather pickers. And then some of the birds just are over grooming. They're like a person that just can't quit combing their hair. Well, eventually you're gonna have hair loss. But again, this bird is gonna start usually picking the chest. Then I see them kind of go for the shoulders, the back of the shoulders. Then they'll go down to the legs down here and then sometimes to their back. And then sometimes they'll, they'll pick on their wing feathers. Uh, I call it a pattern picking. And, and after a while you get pretty used to where they're picking. And then you just have to talk to the owners about what could be causing this. And again, um, like I say, we wanna make sure that the owners aren't over loving their birds. If they are, then we need to become more of a, a friend relationship instead of a lover relationship here. But the main thing I tell people is we need this bird. We need to give this bird a job. This bird needs something to do um, instead of just sitting in its cage all day long, you know, just bored. So I say, let's get the bird a job. Birds are very good at tearing things up. That's what they do best. In the wild, they tear things up. And most birds like either paper 
or cardboard or wood. And I try to get the birds to start tearing other things up instead of tearing themselves up. So, um, and again, the birds don't know how to do this. So if you have an owner that likes to spend time with their bird, I will say you need to teach your bird just like a mother how to tear things up. So I'll say, let your bird sit over here and you take paper or uh, you know some newspaper or cardboard or something. And I want you to just tear it up in front of him until that bird wants to start doing it himself. We want to try to teach him because this bird needs a job. My uh, my African uh, or my uh, Amazon parrot um, would tear up boxes every single day. That was her job is to tear up boxes. And I would get her all the boxes she needed and she would spend part of it talking with us, uh, part of it eating. And if she was didn't have anything to do and she wasn't asleep, she was tearing up her box and that was her job. Here is an African gray parrot. And again, can you see how the head feathers are totally normal, but the body feathers, this bird has really torn themselves up. And I find African gray parrots and cockatoos are the most common feather pickers in my experience. African gray parrots are very, very smart. They're, they're very intelligent, but they kind of walk a tightrope between genius and crazy sometimes. So I love them and I've owned them. However, if if they get upset, they can pull all their feathers out. And again, we have to find out what the cause is and then hopefully get them a job or something to concentrate on that. So like I said, what do we want to do? We want to stop stimulating the bird and have a friend relationship. I want to get this bird a job. I want them to tear things up. Sometimes I can increase uh, the time that it eats. So I give food at different times, or um, if you have a, a big cage or a bird around the house, you can even put bird food in different areas so they have to go look for their food. Uh, there's also enrichment and, uh, um, you know, there's toys that they can play with and things like this, but you have to make sure that they like these and they're, they're spending time doing this. A long time ago, we used to put on Elizabethan collars, and that's what I had on the bird a couple slides ago around the neck. The problem with that is, does it keep them from picking their feathers? Yes, it does. Does it cure the problem? No, they still have the same problem up here. They just can't pick the feathers. This is like you being very itchy, and I can tie your hands together so you don't scratch yourself, but you're still itchy. So what we need to do on these birds is find out what the cause is and try to get them better. Now, sometimes if they really are hurting themselves, we will use Elizabethan collars. Um, and like I said, this is, this is uh, Barney. This is my bird who's in, his, in her box tearing it up. This is another bird I have. And her job is just, she tears boxes up all day long. That's her job and uh, keeps her busy, keeps her occupied and keeps her happy. Like I said, some birds like this, they can make little sweaters and owners will put a little sweater. Some birds will leave these on, some will not leave these on, but this bird seems to be very secure with this little, um, little vest on. And sometimes we'll do this and, and it just, feel secure, like you wrapping up in a blanket. You can use an Elizabethan collar, but usually just short term. This is not going to cure the bird. This is something that I usually only use Elizabethan collars when I have a surgical site or someplace where I need to keep them away from it for about, you know, one to two weeks. But um, again, it can be a temporary fix. Uh, this collar is a piece of x-ray film that I've just cut around. And then if you do the collar, like we've said previously, you have to put some padding around the neck on this collar so it doesn't cut the neck. Um, you'll notice at the bottom, there is a medication that I've started using years ago called haloperidol. 
and it is an anti-anxiety medication. And some of these birds are just very nervous and anxious and they'll tear things up, but they're still just very, very nervous about life. And this is, I, I put how I use the haloperidol. It is, it, the liquid comes two milligrams per milliliter. And then what I do is I will take that liquid and dilute it 50-50, so half and half with distilled water, not regular water, but distilled water um, and making it half strength. And then I will usually dose it at about, of that 50-50 solution, about 0.1 milliliter per 500 grams of body weight. And then I will have them go up and down uh, depending on the, how the bird reacts. Um, what we did years ago that did not work well is we were trying to you know, hold the birds and squirt it in their mouth. What we found, and this is a, a friend of mine, Jeff Jenkins in California was uh, uh, the one that really taught me what to do here. But Jeff found that if there's a little treat, like a little cracker or something that the birds love for treats, we will soak it into the cracker and then give that to the birds and they will eat it. There's no taste, so it, there, it doesn't cause a taste problem. But what they will do is they will eat um, this cracker and it the medication lasts for eight hours. Our mistake is we're trying to squirt it in the mouth, which stressed the bird. Then we were doing it every 12 hours, but it only lasts for eight hours. So if you give it at eight o'clock in the morning, then you need to give it again at about four o'clock or five o'clock. You can't wait until eight o'clock in the evening. And then it will last for about another eight hours. But by the time it wears off, it's the middle of the night and the bird's asleep. So we don't worry about that. But again, it needs to be about every eight hours. And I will increase or decrease the dose as needed because the bird should be a little bit sleepy 15 minutes after you give the medication. Now, not fall off the perch sleepy, but just kind of like if you're in a boring lecture and you're kind of falling, you know, dozing off, that kind of sleepy. And once you find your dose, it seems to work very well. Um, some birds need it all the time. Um, some birds just need it during breeding season because they're very stressed and anxious during breeding season. Uh, some birds, um, like I say, just need it for a period of time until you change their behavior. Um, but it is something that I've found very, very useful in some of the birds. And like I said, this is something I wanted to, um, I wanted to go over, these are, these are very common things. The diseases are very, very quickly. Usually to really diagnose these diseases, you need to do histopathology. So you need to do an autopsy in the birds take a sample, put it in formaldehyde and send it off. Um, uh, however, if you quite often people don't have access to a laboratory and so they need to do quick decisions. Uh -huh. and those quick decisions are sometimes, is there bleeding on the heart or is the liver swollen or is the spleen enlarged? And sometimes those will suggest the different treatments that you need to do right there without having to find a laboratory. Okay, as far as vomiting in parrots, is that the question? Yep. Okay, parrots, remember your birds, they don't actually vomit, they regurgitate. What will happen is they have food up in the crop. Birds are made to eat very quickly and then go back up into a tree and digest because if you're on the ground eating food, that's when things eat you. So you want to eat very quickly and go back up. So they'll have the food uh, in the crop. And a lot of times, if they're regurgitating, we used to call that sour crop. Well, the problem is, is it's usually not a problem in the crop. It's a problem down in the intestinal tract. So I need at that point to usually treat with antibiotics for an intestinal infection that way. Um, in the same way that uh, in toilets in the United States, if you get a toilet that will not flush, 
and the water will not go down in a toilet, it's not in the toilet, it's in the pipes below the toilet is where the blockage is. That's the same thing that happens in birds. So if I'm getting regurgitation that way, like so you can get you can get throwing up from beak and feather disease. Or I mean, I mean, proventr I'm sorry, proventricular dilatation disease, but that's because it's sitting there and not digesting. And again, the problem is down in the stomach because it's blocking it. Um, what you need to do is if you're getting regurgitation, you need to think, is it proventricular dilatation disease? And this is a bird that's losing weight, or is it an infection in the intestinal tract? And again, I will treat with antibiotics usually. It doesn't do any good to give oral antibiotics because it's not going anywhere. He's throwing it up. So a lot of times you have to use injections. And I think the last time I gave a talk, I gave some antibiotic doses. So like I said, it's not the problem right here that you need to treat. It's the problem down deeper. And it's either gonna be a viral infection such as PDD, proventricular dilatation disease, or it'll be bacterial. And I don't know if I, like I say, there's so many causes that like I say, I have access to, to laboratories and things like this, but it's uh, something you can do. If a bird is not eating is suspected of dehydration and shock, how to approach it. Uh, you can give fluids to a bird uh, under the skin and you can use uh, lactated ringers or ringers or, uh, saline under the skin and you can just take your um, your syringe and right between the shoulder blades back here take a little bit of alcohol and that will separate the feathers and just slip it right underneath the skin not in the muscle but just right underneath that very thin skin and you can give sub q fluids to a bird that way you can also give it down between the legs in the groin area and give fluids, you know, that way. If the bird is not eating, a lot of times we will syringe feed them. And the easiest way to do that is to take a tubing. A lot of times you can use a small tracheal tube and put it on a syringe. And we will use uh, uh, something like a, uh, a baby food and squirt through that syringe into the into the uh, stomach into the crop and you can force feed a bird that way to try to get them eating again you have to be don't want to give them too much or they can choke but if i'm going to syringe feed a bird like say fluids are very easy you hold the bird you get it under the skin you can do that twice a day it makes it a lot easier than giving it IV because the birds are going to panic. But fluids are easy. If I'm syringe feeding a bird, I am going to take that syringe and I've got a syringe with a tube on the end and it's going to go down the throat. And I am going to go from the left side of the bird down the right side of the bird's throat and slowly squeeze the baby food. And it would need to be a gruel. Do you know what I'm talking about? A gruel or a, a liquidy food, something that is very, very thin, like an oatmeal type thing. And you can, you can fill them up with that and keep them eating because you can't stick seed down their throat. Am I clear, Dixon, on that? Yeah, then you're clear. There are some more questions are there. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see that the, there's a question about, uh, you know, feather picking by Dr. Aishwarya. She asked any alternative for haloperidol. Okay, let me look. Oh, there we go. There, there, are, there I'm picking up the chat room. There you go. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Let me let me look something real quick. I don't, um, let me um, online courses. Uh, if you'll 
for online courses, if you'll look at the previous talks that I gave at the very end, they talk about some different places that have further veterinary bird free courses that you can get on the internet. Uh, one is lefebvre.com, uh, but look at the previous ones on the website and you'll you'll find that's a good answer there. Um, vomiting parrots, how to treat it. You can't use medicine for the vomiting. We, we have to treat the cause. There's some medicines that'll stop vomiting in dogs and cats. They don't work in birds. What we have to do on vomiting is we have to treat the problem down in the intestinal tract. And usually that is going to be antibiotics. Uh, you don't see a lot of vomiting in birds, thank goodness, uh, or regurgitation in birds. But like I said, it's usually bacterial infections in the intestinal tract. Uh, alternatives to haloperidol. Um, another thing that we've used some is melatonin. And Lauren uh, Powers did uh, over in North Carolina did a good paper on using melatonin. And here in the United States, that's very easy to get in the grocery stores. And it's three milligrams of melatonin dissolved in one cup of water or eight ounces of water, which would be about 240 mils, milliliters of water in the drinking water. And sometimes that will relax the birds a little bit and make them not as nervous and aggressive. If she found it worked about 50% of the time that it's melatonin, three milligrams per 240 milliliters of water, just as drinking water. And it's very easy to, to use without having to use a prescription medication. Uh, a lot of times we will also, like I say, try that for, for feather picking a little bit, but especially if you have a bird that seems to be very, very nervous. Um, can you use ivermectin in birds if skin disease is? Yes, you can. We usually use ivermectin with, um, uh, I usually use ivermectin for like mites, in parakeets where they have nematocytes mites and these are kind of mites on the uh, the the sear a lot of times if i have feather issues i will use pyrethrin or permethrin sprays like you would use on chickens and you can do that uh, again if the birds are kept indoors a lot of times we don't have the parasites it's usually outdoor birds that we see more with uh, the external parasites so you can use ivermectin. The dose um, is 200 micrograms per kilogram. It's, it's, it seems to be about the same as on the, uh, the dogs and cats. The problem is the cattle ivermectin has propylene glycol in it, which given orally can cause a problem in the mouth. So I have a tendency not to use oral ivermectin really in pet birds. I would rather use a pyrethrin or permethrin. Um, so that's what I prefer to use that way. Um, let's see if a, uh, let's see. If a bird is not eating uh, in expective dehydration again, what I'll do there is uh, in shock, keep it warm, keep it quiet. If I give fluids, I give it under the skin in the shoulder because I can do that very quickly without stressing the bird. Again, I'm gonna keep it warm and quiet. The normal body temperature of a bird is 105 to 108 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So it's very, very warm. So we need to keep these birds warm and quiet. And uh, like I said, the main thing is, is fluids. And then I give a little bit syringe feed with kind of a liquidy gruel, but just small amounts, because if you put too much in there and it bumps itself, it can come right back up and choke it. Um, suddenly not able to stand, regurgitate before dying, not able to diagnose. The biggest problem with birds is, and I tell people, I said dogs and cats are very simple compared to birds because they are so frustrating. 
And the people need to know that we're still learning about birds. So sometimes you get the birds that die very quickly. If they do, I try to do an autopsy so I can at least maybe explain to the owner what the reason for the death was so that they will know. Because it's the not knowing that sometimes is so frustrating to them. Um, like say, histopathology is the way to do that. I mean, taking samples in formaldehyde if you have access to a lab. Um, preventing egg binding. Um, I talked about that last lecture. So look at the egg binding protocol. And I have a tendency to just remove the egg by sucking it out rather than trying to use calcium and uh, different products like that. But that's on the last lecture. So I think you'll find that there. Um, fungal diseases, fluconazole, terbinfin. Yes, you can. Those are, uh, I don't have the dose for that right now. And you can find um, the doses. There's a, um, they are published. Um, I think what you can do is there's different uh, groups, websites on even Facebook. Uh, and uh, in the United States, and there's some emails with uh, um, Lefebvre company and some of those that will talk about those doses. I don't have those off the top of my head. Yes, you can use those for fungal diseases. Fungal diseases in birds are usually fatal. Um, aspergillosis being the most common, and it is bad. Generally speaking, they're going to die. We, we feel like Maybe the fluconazole is helping and vericonazole seems to be the new one. It seems to be working. Uh, Terbenafine is working some. Um, so yes, you can do it. I don't have the doses. But um, anything else you see, Dixon? No, that's it. Almost. I'm sorry that's so very quick, but like I said, I'm trying to keep it as practical as I can. I have a friend that just, I went to a lecture. He just talked about trimming the feathers and that was one hour lecture the just on that one subject so i'm trying to be a little faster here and i apologize if i'm not totally perfect with everything but i want you to be able to walk out of this lecture go into an exam room and go you know that bird died i do an autopsy and oh my gosh you know the liver is bigger the spleen it might be this disease if you want to do further, we can do pathology. So, there are two more questions. Said that. Yes. Uh, let's see. Um, some owners complain greenish diarrhea. Yes, you can have. Remember, uh, and sometimes the, the white diarrhea is the urine. This is a this is a bird that's urinating a lot, but not stools. Your stools will be either greenish or brownish, and then you'll have the white urine portion, and then you'll have a watery portion. If I'm seeing only white coming out of this bird, that's urine, but there's no food. So he's not eating, probably. If it's green diarrhea, that can either be diarrhea or if this bird is eating a lot of fruits and vegetables, what will happen is they will be eating their food and the fruits and vegetables. Everything goes through the intestinal tract into the cloaca and it will rest in the cloaca. And then sometimes the stool will get watered down with the urine. So it comes out kind of like if I take dirt and put it in water and pour it out of the bucket, it now looks like mud. And sometimes the diarrhea they're seeing can be normal stool. So if you see some diarrhea and then some regular stools in there, that's just stool that has been soaked up with urine. But like say, if it's greenish diarrhea, ask them what, whether he's been drinking a lot, what he's been eating and that sort of thing. If it is truly diarrhea, sometimes you can look at it under microscope. Sometimes that will be a bacterial infection. So, so like if it's just white diarrhea, that's just urine. My first question is, is this bird eating? Yes, it's eating. Are you sure it's eating or is it just pl playing with its seed? to make you think it's eating because it's worried that you're a predator and it's trying to look normal. So make sure the bird is eating that way. So 